Alex Anderson earned his BA in Studio Art and Chinese from Swarthmore College and his MFA in Ceramics from the University of California, Los Angeles. Anderson previously studied at the Jingdezhen Ceramic Institute in Jingdezhen, China, and was awarded a Fulbright grant in affiliation with the China Academy of Art in Hangzhou, where he continued his studies in ceramic art. His work has been exhibited internationally and across the U.S. and Southern California, including at Human Resources Los Angeles, the Long Beach Museum of Art, and American Museum of Ceramic Art. He lives and works in Los Angeles, California. Alex Anderson uses the delicate medium of ceramics as his main vehicle to explore the intersections of the sublime experiences that make up both the man-made and natural worlds, as well as deeper, more complicated issues of race and cultural representation. His artworks combine a dexterity in the medium with a confluence of Baroque imagery and compositions, Japanese pop art references, and current contemporary fashion and design trends in order to probe the depths of reality, illusion, and identity. At the core of Anderson's practice is a philosophical, existential examination of identity politics relative to his respective backgrounds. By channeling methodologies surrounding artistic production and ceramic arts, Anderson creates fantastic, multifaceted sculptures, synchronously subversive and whimsical. He uses the classical aesthetics of a Western art canon, one ironically sharing space with queer and camp aesthetics, to translate the structures governing his lived experience in society, along with societal perceptions of non-Western identity and form. Anderson's work engages with Western ceramic histories, yet operates, too, at the core of post-blackness. This method of production directly corresponds with current aesthetic and artistic practices and ideologies surrounding theories of post-black art. Working at the intersection of identity politics and aesthetic empowerment, Anderson's ceramic creations appear charming and playful, yet their frivolity is only glazed deep. They contain layered conceptions about blackness, masculinity, and perception, folded and fused together, reciprocating the merging of the artist's lived experience, historical inheritance, and conscious self-awareness. Criticality, political derision, and gender politics are all relevant schemas for Anderson's sculptural oeuvre. Each of his identities has a history of marginalization, received violence, and fetishization. His work gives form to the realities, stereotypes, and cultural perceptions of divergent cultural identities and, as a group, give rise to complex, aporic spaces. Anderson seeks to create a metaphorical world of objects, those that distill his understanding of what it means and how it feels to live through intersectional identities and his resultative place in the contemporary social world. Natalia Arbeleas is a Colombian-American artist, born and raised in Miami, Florida, to immigrant parents. She earned her BFA from Florida International University and her MFA from The Ohio State University. Her work has been exhibited internationally in museums, galleries, and included in various collections, such as the Everson Museum, MAD Museum, and ICA Miami. She was a resident artist at the ceramics program at Harvard University, where she researched pre-Columbian art and histories. Natalia was an artist-in-residence at the Museum of Art and Design and the American Museum of Ceramic Arts, where she researched the work of historical and influential women ceramicists of color. She lives and works in the Mid-Hudson Valley region in New York. In the words of Natalia Arbeleas, in my work, I am a storyteller. I am telling narratives about my Colombian family's immigration, the pre-Columbian South American presence, and my American latchkey after-school cartoon childhood. All of these stories work together to create a multi-component self-portrait of what it is like to be a mestizo Colombian american hybrid. Mining tidbits from historical research, familial narratives, and cartoon culture, I create surreal stories in clay, much in the way Gabriel Garcia Marquez did with words. 
autobiographically narrating history with its ups and downs, its humor and tears. Making My Work is an act of revealing undervalued histories from Latin America, Amerindian, and women of color. These identities are lost through conquest, migration, and time, then gained through family, culture, and exploration, and finally passed down through tradition, preservation, and genetic memory. I have found value in my histories and aim to help preserve my cultures by honoring them through my artwork. The Mestizo series tells the story of a violent ancestry. Despite how this history is archived or acknowledged, this is the ancestry that most Latin Americans come from. In Mestizo, I speak of two ancestries coming together through fight and plight. I use the materials in their histories as metaphors for colorism, colonization, and ancestry, using bare terracotta to reference the land of South America, where the material has a long history and artistic presence, but also referencing an indigenous ancestry. When I use Mayalica, I speak of a Spanish ancestry and the history of the material arriving to the Americas in the 16th century. I use this white glaze as a metaphor for whitewashing and colonization. This glaze was historically used to hide terracotta. Gold in my work references hierarchy, value, and also my homeland of Colombia. I often pair the gold next to the terracotta as a reminder of how both materials are found in the same place rivers and mountains, and do this to point out how terracotta continues to be seen as a lesser material. Other times, you'll find gold pieces on the top of a configuration as the false idol the Spanish allowed to lead them. I use all these materials not to suggest that one is more valuable than the other, but to speak to the beauty that each material contains. I use the pairing of materials, cartoon embellishments, and history to tell the narrative of a hybrid existence of what it's like to be a mestizo, Colombian, American, 21st century person. Jepeth Asiedu Quertang, born 1987 in Ghana, is an MFA candidate at Illinois State University. Asiedu Quartang is a member and multicultural fellow of the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts and has featured in several prestigious exhibitions in Ghana and in the U.S., including the 2021 and Sika Annual and Multicultural Fellowship Exhibitions. He was a presenter on the theme, Ghanaian Ceramics Now, a Hodan, at the 2021 and Sika Conference. Being the first student to hail from Ghana in any studio discipline at Woonsuk Kim School of Art, ISU, Asiedu Kwarteng was honored to receive a Baber Fellowship to support his first-year studies as a top graduate student. Asiedu Kwarteng's works are largely inspired by traditional Ghanaian and African symbolism. His ongoing thesis project is inspired by kente cloth expanding its symbolism both in writing and in artworks to discuss the experiences of the Ghanaian African diaspora. The U.S. has indeed been fertile ground for their practice as a ceramic artist. For the past two years of their stay and study, it has been a space filled with all the experiences that one can think of as a person of color. These experiences fill their diary as the not truly ordinary encounters of a non-immigrant. Their work, Everything and Nothing, The Diary of One Who Leaves, is inspired by these experiences in the U.S. Comprising varied forms, spaces, shapes, movements, and etc., it is a catalog of their encounters as a non-immigrant. It is a memorial of their feelings and thoughts, belonging, fear, nostalgia, separation, collective trauma, etc., Everything and Nothing, The Diary of One Who Leaves, is made largely in clay, glaze, and ceramic stain with a touch of cloth, jute rope, wood, plaster, and epoxy. It was built with clay slabs of Konsik stoneware with a bit of gluing to attach the other non-ceramic media. Like an urn, it is draped with a kente cloth depicting memories. Their work is made as an element of reverence and awe that comes from being confronted by something monumental. This piece functions as a monument, bringing forth numerous shapes, spaces, forms, movements, etc., and bringing forth diverse feelings, memories, and experiences. It accommodates the good, bad, and ugly, projecting a sense of belonging and a fertile ground to accommodate diversity to foster coexistence. 
In the words of Japeth Asiedu Kwarteng, what is in your diary? Does it border on negative or positive experiences and encounters, or a bit of both? My diary is filled with the not truly ordinary life and experiences of a non-immigrant. The adaptation and assimilation to these daunting realities without losing yourself is not truly ordinary. It is sink or swim. This diary is a monumental visual language commemorating my memories, mixed feelings, and traumatic experiences. It is my appreciation, made material, of possessing multiple personalities while living in dual worlds. It is my intent to deconstruct and reconstruct patterns of kente cloth to expand their definitions and functions. Conventionally, fabrics and fibers speak to that which is intimate, personal, and often related to the body and its functions. I am exploring these communicative potentials of the language of fabrics and fibers to invite my audience into my life and culture to create awareness and appreciation of the experiences and culture of an immigrant. Ashwini Bhatt, an artist born in southern India, currently lives and works in the Bay Area, California. Coming from a background in literature and classical Indian dance, she now works at the intersection of sculpture, ceramics, installation, and performance. She often introduces radical but somehow familiar forms to suggest a complex interplay between the landscape, the human, and the non-human. Bott is a recipient of the McKnight Foundation Residency Fellowship and the Howard Foundation Award for Sculpture. This clay performance piece the earth under our feet, is a response to questions of belonging. It is reflective of their own journey in this world and their search for a personal sense of place, a home. The wellspring of their essence is rooted in situation, and they firmly believe that if we feel we belong to a place, we must recognize that it also belongs and belonged to others. They see their clay performance as a poetic intervention, exploring questions of collective identities, materiality, fragility, and impermanence. By juxtaposing her own brown body with the brown clay body, she urges viewers to notice our entangled and our ethical connection to the ground we stand on. The text is intended to be a mantra, a prayer, a meditation on belonging as a spiritual quest. The performance makes reference to the traditional symbolism of feet in Indian iconography, and it is an acknowledgment of the earliest hominid footprints in Laetoli. The process is inspired by South Asian practices of foot wedging clay and by her own background in dance. She has borrowed the title from the notebooks of George Oppen, an American objectivist poet and a political activist who wrote, The Earth Under Our Feet. We are not asked to begin nowhere. In the words of Ashwini Bhatt, I'm not interested in creating a perfect object, if what defines an object is our removal from it. Instead, I'm searching for gestural links that emphasize what we share with the non-human world, how we are related not only to animals, but to trees, for instance. The awareness of our relatedness has ethical implications as we recognize that we ourselves are not masters set apart from everything else, but living communities of different organisms affected even by the inanimate world. I want my art to materialize a personal environment in which the suggestively biomorphic volumes of my sculptures or installations or performance engage the viewer, so tactile apprehension leads to recognition, to contemplation, and to moments of exhilaration. If I'm not making art with some awareness of what is at stake in our time, I wouldn't want to be an artist. Horatio Casillas was born in Chandler, Arizona, and raised in Jalisco, Mexico, until the age of five. His family then moved back to the U.S. to San Angelo, Texas. In 2013, he earned his BFA in ceramics from Angelo State University and his MFA from the University of North Texas in 2018. Horatio's work was published in 2019's January issue of Ceramics Monthly and has been exhibited nationally with recent gallery representation from Companion Gallery. Casillas recently left a production pottery and a landscaping job and is currently one of the resident artists at Aeromont School of Arts and Crafts in Tennessee. 
Rowe's window relates to the exhibition concept of belonging because it's both a literal and metaphorical representation of where their sense of belonging comes from and the place that validates their identity. In the words of Horatio Casillas, my work is strongly focused on evoking connection between the corporal and the spiritual. I carve my work to represent cathedral windows and entryways inspired by Gothic architecture and the Catholic churches of my hometown of Tepetitlan, Jalisco, Mexico. My hope is to contribute something beautiful to society, something that can have a powerful effect on the human heart, drawing us out of ourselves into something greater and higher, something that can fill us with a hunger for truth, goodness, and beauty that transcends the mundane. Pope John Paul II said in his letters to artists, the purpose of art is nothing less than the upliftment of the human spirit. Focusing my work through the lens of my Catholic faith has given me an appreciation for the traditions found in the church, including her influence on architecture. Adam Chow is an artist working in New York, a graduate of the School of Art Institute's Designed Objects program in 2013. His current body of work is an integration of digital manufacturing with traditional studio ceramics. His research has been published in Ceramics Technical, Studio Potter, Ceramics Art and Perception, Ceramics Monthly, and New Ceramics. In 2018, he was awarded the Ensica Emerging Artist Award. In 2019, he was accepted into the International Academy of Ceramics. Solo exhibitions include Harvard Ceramics, Manchester Craftsman Guild, and the clay studio Dao Shui Xuan. International projects and residencies have included Italy, the Netherlands, Taiwan, and China. In 2017, Chow curated Reinvented, an exhibition featuring 13 international artists who created ceramics digitally and which traveled the U.S. to five locations. He is currently a board member of Art Access and co-organizer of the Color Network. The internet has opened up ways of communication unimaginable to previous generations of technology. It has helped us globalize and create networks for friends, family, colleagues, and business relationships. With all this contact, there is a small, teeny corner left for people wanting a bit more, the missed connection. Almost Missed Connections is a series that uses Craigslist misconnection headers as material to look at a space that beckons for belonging to that one other person. He has taken messages from the Sacramento Craigslist to laser etch into porcelain tile. The text, written in script to enforce the idea of human connection, is barely visible and can only be read up close. He requests that the tiles be installed in different, unconventional locations where the public can come upon them in a spontaneous way. This play with audience and object creates a conversation about public-private, active-passive participation, and how we call attention to others online. In the words of Adam Chow, my process of creating ceramics hybridizes digital technology and traditional studio techniques. Coming from an industrial design background, I found ways to incorporate the human hand in digital manufacturing methods. The content of my work ranges from selfies, mannerisms from the millennial generation to poetic text messages, as I believe that text is a 21st century love letter. I often use the tiles format based on the shape of electronics. I am interested in the smartphone being both a two-dimensional and three-dimensional object at the same time, much like a ceramic tile. I find the scale of a smartphone is intimate and persuasive in drawing an audience in due to the familiarity of such a domestic object that can fit in one hand. Patsy Cox earned her BFA from Missouri State University and her MFA from the University of Delaware. She has been Professor of Visual Art and Head of Ceramics at California State University Northridge since 2000. Cox served as President of the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts from 2010 through 2016, Director at Large from 2003 through 2005, and is a Fellow of the Council. She is currently serving on the board of the American Museum of Ceramic Art. She has participated in the Annenberg Alchemy and Alchemy Plus programs for nonprofit excellence. Cox has been a Getty Scholar for the Linking Service Learning and the Visual Arts Program and has coordinated courses for the CSU Summer Arts Program. 
She is an installation-based artist who has exhibited and lectured nationally and internationally. She lives and maintains a productive studio in the Los Angeles area. The Bluest Eye relates to the exhibition concept of belonging because this commemorative plate is a celebration of Toni Morrison's first novel, The Bluest Eye, which at its core is about race, gender, and social economic belonging. It was a response to a prompt aimed at celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote in the U.S. In the words of Patsy Cox, Diversity, assimilation, growth, and movement within the context of a particular place are the focus of my work. The use of color often serves as a metaphor for race and culture. My studio process involves using traditional methods of fabrication and execution that are tied to craft history. Utilizing symbol and form in repetition, accumulation serves as a record of labor in the presence of the hand. Jessica Edgar is a ceramic artist based in Metro Detroit. Raised in both Western Massachusetts and Southern California, Edgar has an MFA in ceramics from Cranbrook Academy of Art, an MA and BA in studio art from California State University, Northridge. She has been awarded residencies at Gulda Gerigard International Ceramic Research Center, the Banff Center for the Arts and Creativity, Wasaic Projects, the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild, and AIR Valeris. Get It While You Can relates to the exhibition concept because in her research, she investigates the construction of individual identity as prescribed by societal notions of value and binaries. In the words of Jessica Edgar, I investigate the construction of individual identity as prescribed by societal notions of value and binaries. I pull reference material from popular culture ephemera in media imagery, especially related to gender, beauty, and material desire. Through my sculptures, I aim to create a feeling of cognitive dissonance, a psychological space that is simultaneously critical and indulgent. This research manifests itself in the form of abstract ceramic sculptures as I question the established hierarchy that places craft below art. I utilize crafty materials, not just clay, but mixed media that includes faux fur, acrylic pearly, mod podge, and glitter. In contrast to these commercially derived materials, I draw from a long history of sculptural abstraction. Inspired by Islamic architecture and human vulnerability, Toronto-based artist Habiba El Sayad combines clay with a variety of materials, performative and temporal techniques to illustrate her concepts. Habiba holds an advanced diploma from Sheridan College in Ceramics from 2014 and a BFA in Ceramics from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design from 2016. She is a recipient of the Creativity Everything Fellowship in 2021 and recently completed a three-year residency at Harborfront Center in Toronto in 2019. El Sayed's work has been shown in galleries and museums across North America and has been featured in publications such as Craft is Political, Black Flash Magazine, Fusion Magazine, and Studio Potter. Keen to share her knowledge, her practice also includes regular guest lecturing and workshops at museums and universities. She is currently preparing for upcoming exhibitions at the Clay Space Studio in Toronto's East End. Habiba El Sayed's work focuses on human vulnerability, empathy, and perception, often drawing on her own personal experiences as a Muslim woman of mixed descent, Guyanese, and Egyptian. Moving beyond traditional techniques, she uses clay's inherent material properties to illustrate feelings of exhaustion, breakage, resilience, and hope through performance art, temporal works, and sculpture. In recent years, her multidisciplinary practice has grown to include digital integrations such as projection, digital collage, and laser cutting. This shift towards the digital is also reflected conceptually as she explores the ever-evolving ways we experience emotion, process information, and express empathy online. 
Her most recent work, Fragile Plane, parallels Egyptian mythologies with contemporary experience while re-imaging historical references using a combination of both old and new technologies. Born in a small village in Portugal, Nazare Feliciano is Professor Emeritus from Palm Beach State College, Palm Beach, Florida. After the revolution of April 25, 1974 in Portugal, she exiled to the U.S. In New York City, she surrounded herself with art and artists, namely working for Fortney Fabrics, where she met the most accomplished interior designers. In 1992, she moved to Boca Raton, Florida, where she pursued her dreams to create, using sculpture and clay as her mediums. The clay artistic immersion in Florida was followed by an MFA in Interdisciplinary Arts at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. The emphasis on research at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago led Feliciano to seek a Ph.D. in Comparative Studies in Fine and Performing Arts, which she completed in 2014 with a thesis, Bodily Knowledge in Dance, Transferred to the Creation of Sculpture. After 20 years of teaching art, Feliciano is now exploring new ideas for artworks, but still using clay as the core material. Immigrant Ballad is inspired by the cultural and geographical adaptation to a new world, a new culture, and the nostalgia and sense of loss towards the place where one once lived, with family and friends, another culture, another world. In Immigrant Ballad, Feliciano articulates feelings of belonging and displacement. The visual cues on both artworks evoke elements of group crafting traditions, such as quilting and the ritual of singing a rhyme over and over. Rituals and traditions build community and culture in a sense of belonging. Immigrant Ballad comprises 130 cubes, each one and a half by one and a half inches by three quarters of an inch, measuring overall 36 by 28 inches. Each porcelain block is connected with steel wire, making the sculptural piece malleable, blanket-like. The metal needles at the end of each row illustrate quilting or weaving, activities usually done in groups that promote bonding, community, and a sense of belonging. The text on the immigrant ballad piece is a rhyme sung by Mexican immigrants living in Chicago. Written in Spanish and English, it cries out the plight of the Mexican immigrant community who suffered discrimination. In the words of Nazar Feliciano, I have been using clay and metal to create artworks for the past 20 years. Creating with clay and the camaraderie that I have experienced with other artists working with clay has been inspiring for my artwork. Working with other clay artists has always given me a sense of belonging that manifests itself in my artwork. Community, ritual, and traditions have been constant inspirations for my art. At the same time, I expand and explore different ways and processes to manipulate clay, as well as different ways that clay can be presented. For example, the quilt-like pieces I have created using steel wire add malleability and a new visual to the clay material. It is not a static mosaic or a pot or solid form. Using steel also positions clay, always considered an ancient material on a contemporary platform. Research has been a cornerstone to what I want to say with my artwork. I researched nursery rhymes of various cultural communities in the U.S. for the quilt pieces. Jasmine Fetterman is interested in the identity duality of a masculine-born body and its relation to the spaces that it specifically has to exist in, creating a space that is both hyper-personal and extremely detached. Jasmine wants to explore this part of their identity and that they are tied to because of their male-born body and how being raised in that way and those spaces influenced how they developed an understanding of themselves. The public bathroom is a public and private space. The urinal is designed for the use of male-born bodies, and in the development of a male person's identity, they become a sort of rite of passage into manhood. In itself, the urinal is just a vessel or a depository for a human's byproduct, but its layout, design, and usual proximity to one another forces a confrontation and examination. The public bathroom becomes a stage and an arena for the performability to one's masculinity, forcing comparisons. 
In the words of Jasmine Fetterman, I use a multidisciplinary and research-based approach to explore the complex and fluid nature of identity as a universal concept throughout humanity. Coming from the heritage of Eastern Europe as a first-generation American, I reference themes of Western histories, mythologies, and aesthetics to explore the politics of the queer body and its relationship to constructed space. My desire is to create space for the inclusion of these bodies within film, media, and the art world. Fetterman focuses on the necessity of a utopic, liminal, transformational space that they have labeled as queer architecture, while also giving an indirect critique of socioeconomic class and gender structures and hierarchies. They have shown around the Pacific Northwest, most recently at the Henry Museum in 2021, as well as in the Southwest. They hold an MFA from the 3D4M program at the University of Washington, completed in 2021. Rahaela Filsufi is a collector of soil and sound, an itinerant artist, feminist curator, and community service advocate. Her work synthesizes sociopolitical statements as a point of departure and further challenges these fundamental arguments by incorporating ancient and contemporary media such as ceramics, poetry, ambient sound, and video. Her interdisciplinary practice acts as the interplay between the literal and figurative contexts of land, ownership, immigration, and border. Her work has been shown individually and collaboratively, both in Iran and in the U.S. She is the recipient of grants and awards, including the 2021 Southern Prize Tennessee State Fellowship and the South Florida Cultural Consortium Fellowship for Visual and Media Artists. She is an assistant professor of ceramics in the Department of Art at Vanderbilt University. She holds an MFA in fine arts from Florida Atlantic University and a BFA in ceramics from Al Zahara University in Tehran, Iran. Bite is a practice of resilience and resistance. They attempt to bring forth the buried histories of the past to reimagine and transcend the colonial narrative present in clay particles of the earth and artifacts throughout history. The artist, woman, immigrant is a witness and agent who exposes the urgency of contemporary moments. She uses her body as a tool and embeds its unique identifying mark on clay artifacts for future narrative and interpretation creating a new narrative that emerges with respect to past knowledge and making a pattern of her existence, it validates her strength in the current political landscape. Both labor and ritual, the physicality of the action provokes attention to the internal. Form, pattern, and function are captured as she sinks her teeth into the clay, an artifact from when her body and spirit were borderless, an act of defiance and affirmation that leaves a mark of her existence for the future, to change the narrative, to become the narrative. She attempts to bring forth the buried histories of the past to reimagine and transcend the colonial narrative present in clay particles of the earth and artifacts throughout history. Bite aligns with the exhibition concept, reversing, reimagining, and transcending the colonial history envisioned by the dominant white male narrative. Biting deep into the clay from various locations in the U.S. is a tactile approach to establishing her identity as a Middle Eastern woman. In respecting the autochthonous knowledge and values of a place to explore its human geography, past and present, the act of biting is symbolic to her own struggle for place and belonging. In the words of Rahaela Filsufi, my multimedia practice covers a vast amount of experiential, geographical, disciplinary, and conceptual ground, and it formed my philosophy in my studio and instructional practice. Through my installations, I focus on the human condition, and they are rooted in my cultural background and identity as an immigrant. I explore concepts of origin, heritage, and cultural orientation. I grew up during the wars in Iran, and since immigrating, I've lived in Toronto, Canada, South Florida, the Rio Grande Valley, and Nashville. Crossing these lands, I wondered who traveled before and who will travel after. Curious, I became a collector of soil and sound. Above ground, sound holds no memory. Below, the soil speaks of diversity and identity. Moving and relocation spur questions about land, 
ownership, and immigration, and are interwoven with identity, inhabitation, and belonging. Through investigation, I hope to unearth Indigenous and immigrant stories that reveal the similar humanness in our search for place. Eleanor Foy is a multidisciplinary artist currently based in Kansas City, Missouri. Raised in the South San Francisco Bay Area, the landscape and mythology of California and the American West continue to inform her work. After studying painting for three years at Pratt Institute in New York, Foy transferred to Kansas City Art Institute to complete her BFA in ceramics. This change in focus was compelled by a desire to work in a medium that spans fine art, craft, and mass production. Foy has been awarded the Ken Ferguson Scholarship, McCowan Special Project Award, and Mentorship Award at Kansas City Art Institute, as well as the Regina Brown Undergraduate Student Fellowship through the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts. She is interested in how domestic objects express cultural values and seeks to unpack the complicated layers of meaning in seemingly mundane images of Americana. Foy is currently a resident at Belger Crane Yard Studios in Kansas City. Meet Me in Heaven relates to the exhibition concept of belonging because it embodies the ongoing exploitation of people and resources in the U.S., both landscape and tombstone, the phrase, meet me in heaven, is lifted from the grave marker of Anna Brown, an Osage woman who was murdered for her mineral rights in 1921. Settler colonialism has twisted the concept of belonging from signifying community to prioritizing ownership. The cowboys in a gun battle represent the perpetual violence of such an interpretation of belonging, often trivialized by children's toys, blockbuster movies, and other popular media. As a landscape, this sculpture is a question about the motives of American attachment to place and possession. As a tombstone, it is a reminder of the human cost of greed and denial of belonging. In the words of Eleanor Foy, the image of the cowboy drifting within spectacular and desolate landscapes is an intrinsic part of American culture. Westerns embody and perpetuate the violence of our colonial past, outlining our relationship to history, land, and language. In my current body of work, I present Western landmarks as TV lamps, an appliance invented in the 1950s to alleviate the strain of watching television in the dark. Clay is both the material found within the landscapes I represent and the medium of its commodification in mass-produced souvenirs and tchotchkes. Colored bulbs evoke sunsets, marquee lights, and bachelor pad mood lighting, projecting beauty and doom. The construction of these objects is both an indulgence in and a criticism of romantic Americana. I am driven by the necessity to unlearn what we have been taught, unpack what we respond to, and expose the implications of the objects we surround ourselves with. Alina Hayes Hayes is a Los Angeles-based artist. She grew up in New York and began her education at the School of Visual Arts, where she studied illustration and painting. Upon relocating to Los Angeles in 2005, Hayes continued her education at California State University, Northridge, where she earned her BA in art and MA in art with an emphasis in ceramics. Presently, Hayes is an adjunct professor at Ventura Community College. Born into a family of various trades, Alina Hayes embraces her family's ancestry with her work in clay. The daughter of a jeweler and musician, granddaughter of a potter and surgeon, hands were an important and essential part of her family's everyday lives in connection to others. In much the same way, they have come to shape her perception of the world and her love for the handmaid. The work titled Alien relates to the exhibition concept because the word alien, according to the dictionary, means belonging to a foreign country, a foreigner. It is a term that is used to identify immigrants as well as extraterrestrial beings. She has often pondered the use of the word as she too is a legal alien. In an attempt to fit in, she has often concealed things about herself and for years wanted to blend in, to belong, to be like everyone else. This piece in many ways is also alien to the traditional ceramic processes and rules, if you will. It is covered in rubber with a color-shifting pigment. 
The pigment changes the color dramatically when in direct light, revealing the true exterior, but also allows it to blend in when not in the spotlight. In the words of Alina Hayes, in my studio practice, the work moves between form and function as I think about fluidity of materials, process, and time. Drawing on parallels between the unpredictability of the ceramic process and the shortcomings I often feel as an immigrant, woman, wife, mother, and educator, I am obsessed with succeeding, becoming something of value, and the connectedness as I sit and shape intricate clay objects. I create fragile forms, resilient to time and change, in hopes that the bimorphic exterior will forge a relationship with the viewer and prevent them from being discarded as remnants of their maker. Keeping these thoughts in check, I walk into the studio and I make, pushing my work in many directions, using and exploring materials I wouldn't have otherwise. At the end of the day, these objects emerge. They are playful, loud, unapologetic, mine. I call it the bloop series, or another word for mistake, as I fumble through my daily chores and obligations, reminding myself that what I do is worthwhile. Salvador Jimenez Flores was born in Jalisco, Mexico. He migrated to Chicago at the age of 15 without knowing any English in search of the American dream. His family migration stories are connected to manual labor and political agreements that affected both Mexico and the USA. Jimenez Flores has presented his work at the National Museum of Mexican Art, Grand Rapids Art Museum, Urban Institute of Contemporary Art, Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, and Museum of Art and Design, among others. He has served as artist-in-residence for the City of Boston, Harvard Ceramics Program, Office of the Arts at Harvard University, and Kohler Arts Industry. Jimenez Flores is a recipient of Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grants and the New England Foundation for the Arts, Three Walls RAD Lab Plus Outside the Walls Fellowship Grant, and he is a 2021 United States Artist Fellow. He is an assistant professor in ceramics at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Jimenez Flores is a member of the Color Network, an organization that promotes the advancement of people of color in the ceramic arts and assists artists to develop, network, and create dialogue while maintaining a place for a database, resources, and mentorship. He is also a member of the Instituto Grafico de Chicago, an organization inspired by the socio-political art of Mexico's Taller de Grafica Popular, the People's Print Workshop, and uses art as a platform to inform and generate community discourse about urgent social issues. In the words of Salvador Jimenez Flores, my work explores the politics of identity, the state of double consciousness, and the outlook of the other. I address issues of colonization, migration, history, cultural appropriation, and futurism. I create hybrid portraits that represent my anxieties of living in a constant state of double consciousness, where I feel like my identity is divided into parts. The challenge of being bicultural and bilingual is that I live concurrently in two different worlds. I adapt to both worlds, but adapting involves losing some part of myself in order to grow. I embrace these two worlds in my art, melding visual and cultural references from both to produce artwork with a magical realism twist. My work reveals this hybridity. I draw on elements of Afrofuturism, funk ceramics, and Robert Arneson's satiric comedy and powerful ceramic self-portraits, as much as the music and films by Sun Ra and Mexican singer-songwriter Rodrigo Gonzalez, also known as the Nopal Prophet. I am drawn to how these artists create their own imaginary world through their art. I use these influences to create my own imaginary world of Rasquache futurism, where I can articulate pre-Columbian, colonial, and post-colonial histories and aesthetics through ceramics. My artwork titled A Hand Gesture to Systemic Racism is a representation of my personal frustrations with structural racism that Black, Indigenous, immigrants, refugees, and people of color experience on a daily basis in the United States of America. We experience visible and invisible racisms in the workplace, schools, churches, government, universities, and in the public through microaggressions, xenophobia, 
discrimination, bullying, manipulation, and more. For over seven years, I have been part of diversity, equity, and inclusion task forces for various organizations and universities. And as much as I push for actionable and pragmatic items, nothing really happens but the organization's pride on their DEI committees and initiatives. Kevin Cow is an artist and educator living in Greenville, South Carolina. In his work, he addresses identity is dependent on formal codes. Typically creating work in multiples, themes of collective identity are contrasted against the individual, often functioning as a metaphor for assimilation. Having exhibited his work across the nation, he is currently assistant professor of art at Furman University. Fallacies, buns, consists of several individual hair buns created from a starting set of 26 molds. Individual parts are molded, assembled, and recombined in the same manner in which the terracotta army was created for Emperor Qin Shi Huang. He views the research and mirroring of ancient Chinese mold-making methods as a way of processing and connecting to an ancestral spirit, one of which was dictated through an unyielding desire to be remembered. The piece ultimately serves as a metaphor for the East Asian American experience, in which we may all seem to look the same with our jet black hair and yet could not be more individually different. In the words of Kevin Cow, as a cultural hybrid, I address perceptions of individuality, body, and kitsch through the lens of the other. I am fascinated by the complex relationship between individual and group, often creating work in multiples as a metaphor for assimilation. These are ceramic multiples, a collection, trace, and expansion on notions of belonging, loss of individuality, and the power of group influence. Drawing from ancient art histories, I use humor and double entendre to facilitate a dialogue between representation, hair, and flesh. In the larger context of my work, I'm interested in the perception of value and its relationship to history, craft, and authorship. I continually question these ideas through a uniquely sculptural perspective, examining how the material has been handled historically and how I can use it to address body, gaze, taste, and objectification. Clay Leonard is an American artist. He earned his MFA from Bowling Green State University and his BFA from Adrian College. He currently serves as an associate professor of ceramics at the University of Houston, Clear Lake in Houston, Texas. Leonard has also been an artist in residence at the International Ceramic Research Center, Guldegergaard in Denmark, Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas, and CRETA Rome in Rome, Italy. His current research focuses on the important ritual of sharing a meal, utilizing ceramic serving forms as a catalyst for interaction and communication. His work has been featured in various international and national exhibitions and publications. His work is included in various public collections, including the International Museum of Dinnerware Design in Michigan, Guldegard International Ceramic Research Center in Denmark, and the National Museum of Slovenia. Connected Cups relates to the exhibition concept as this work utilizes an anamorphic gold rectangle that unifies multiple cup forms, highlighting the significance of connection, communication, and interaction. Through the use of line and placement, the work is a reference to the social significance of individuals and how they relate to the community. The gold line unifies the cups while continuing to highlight the work as a catalyst for conversation between the users. In the words of Clay Leonard, some of my favorite childhood memories were formed around the dinner table with family and friends, eating and engaging in conversation. I'm drawn to the communal aspects of serving vessels while continuing to investigate their contemporary social significance. Through my work, I highlight the important ritual of sharing a meal, utilizing my ceramic serving forms as a catalyst for interaction, connection, and communication. Formally, my work strikes a balance between pristine design and qualities of the handmade object. I have an affinity for crisp lines, creative innovation, and simple geometric form, and I instill my work with subtlety and softness that serve to highlight the process of production and to humanize the work. I utilize the interaction of multiple forms to mimic the work's intent, 
while making connections to social interactions. My communal vessel forms reinforce the social significance of connection, offering an incentive for interpersonal interaction and to reclaim the table. Cindy Lung earned her BFA in Studio Arts from Queen City College, City University of New York in Queens, New York. She recently completed her MFA in Ceramics at the University of Florida, Gainesville, Florida. She currently works for the Ocala Cultural Arts as an exhibit technician intern. Her work is about the exchange of languages and cultures in a post-colonial setting. She has exhibited her work nationally and internationally, including the Clay Art Center in New York, Morian Art Center in Florida, and the Jing Dejin Ceramic Institute in China. All the sculptures for this series were made according to the Chinese computer input method, Sheng. There are 26 alphabets paired with 26 Chinese characters for typing Chinese. For example, the letter B is paired with the character that means moon in Chinese. She created shapes that resemble the letter and a scene in which the moon shines through mountains in the dark in To Accentuate. This combination shows the perfect balance between all the languages she speaks because they coexist harmoniously. To Erect shows an upside down T with a fork-like T component in the middle that looks like the Chinese corresponding character. The aggressive action is carried out by the interaction of the materials. It also shows the power balance between the languages she speaks. It is because she often finds herself not being able to speak Chinese fluently if she had been speaking English more often than Chinese. To confine is a piece where the meaning of the Chinese character cadaver manifests in the form of its corresponding English letter S. This piece shows how she feels trapped at times when she needs to identify herself and that she can only be of one identity. All three pieces relate to the theme of the exhibition because they talk about where she belongs. It is a place where ambiguity and hybridity exist in which she doesn't have to choose between being Chinese, British, or American. In the words of Cindy Lung, the constant migration in my life leads me to never feel fully Chinese, British, or American. My hybrid identity leads me to code switch, using multiple languages in a conversation. Driven by these experiences, I make 26 hybrid objects out of silk, tea, and porcelain. The number of the objects is determined by the Chinese computer input method, Su Shang, that I use frequently. In the system, there are 26 alphabets paired with 26 Chinese characters for typing Chinese. This system shows interactions of the two languages and thus brings out the essence of code switching. It is crucial for me to use mixed materials to emphasize my hybrid identity. Silk, tea, and porcelain were also commodities the British invaded China for in the past. Each object is named with a verb to show the balance between the two languages within me. By making 26 hybrid objects with specific materials and in the Su Shang system, I see my work as visual manifestations of the hybridity in my identity and language. Linda Nguyen Lopez was born in 1981 in Visalia, California. She is a first-generation American artist of Vietnamese and Mexican descent. Through her abstract works, she explores the poetic potential of the everyday by imagining and articulating a vast emotional range embedded in the mundane objects that surround us. Lopez earned a BFA from California State University, Chico, and an MFA from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Her works have been exhibited in Italy, New Zealand, England, and throughout the U.S., including the Craft Contemporary Museum, Los Angeles, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, Bentonville, Long Beach Museum of Art, Long Beach, The Hole, New York, Jane Hartsook Gallery at Greenwich House Pottery, New York, Museum of Art and Design, New York, Mindy Solomon Gallery, Miami, and David B. Smith Gallery, Denver. Lopez is an assistant professor at the University of Arkansas. Linda Lopez's history is full of gaps, voids, and untold stories. Her foundation is forever shifting, her identity malleable like a piece of clay, and her roots never grew deep in a place she called home. 
Her mother, a Vietnamese refugee, and her father, a Mexican immigrant, fled their countries for a better future. As immigrants, her parents shed their roots to assimilate them as a family. Cultural rituals, food, and language became a quick, distant past, and she found herself questioning her identity. English was the only shared language in the household, and none of them spoke it well. The translation of language provided a large threshold for meaning and interpretation. It allowed for chairs to be tired, couches to be hungry, and leaves to dance. Although language was an obstacle, it provided a perspective and empathy with the inanimate. This allowed her to see everything in a new lens and understand it for its truest state. In the words of Linda Lopez, as a California native, I grew up amongst the orange orchards for more than 20 years. I can close my eyes and smell the fresh citrus blossoms and see the sparkle of the golden sun. As a first-generation American, my parents shed their cultural roots to assimilate us as a family. And now I find myself questioning my identity, my roots, and my heritage. In a silent household where English was an obstacle, I forged a bond with the inanimate, common objects that later became subjects in my work. Rugs, toilets, dust, and plants called for empathy and understanding. This perspective allowed me to see everything through a new lens and to understand it for its purest state. Through the absence of language, I have created a visual vocabulary that has allowed me to interpret the world around me. This strange land is full of characters made from ceramic objects called dust furries, nubbies, plants, bushes, mounds, and nets. These playful and beautiful objects are somewhat familiar, yet I question how we perceive and navigate the world around us. Kanupa Henska Luger is a multidisciplinary artist and an enrolled member of the three affiliated tribes of Fort Berthold. Through monumental installations and social collaboration, Luger activates speculative fiction and communicates stories about 21st century indigeneity, combining critical cultural analysis with dedication and respect for the diverse materials, environments, and communities he engages. He lectures and produces large-scale projects around the globe, and his works are in many public collections. Luger is a recipient of a 2021 United States Artist Fellowship Award for Craft and was named a 2021 Grist Fixer. He is a 2020 Creative Capital Fellow and a 2020 Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow and the recipient of the Museum of Arts and Design's 2018 inaugural Burke Prize, among others. In the words of Kanupa Hanska Luger, as a contemporary artist indigenous to North America, I am motivated to reclaim and reframe a more accurate version of 21st century Native American culture and its powerful global relevance. Given the legacies of cultural appropriation and annihilation brought on by colonization, the endurance of tradition is characterized by resilience, adaptability, and survivance. In recognition of this legacy, I place myself between the realms of contemporary art and indigenous culture, moving amidst academia and the front lines in order to enact a more complex understanding of contemporary indigeneity. The materials that I use are emblematic of human civilization, such as clay, textile, steel, and digital media, which I distill as cultural reflection into an object, installation, or action. Whether working with institutions, communities, or with the land itself, my work is inherently social and requires engagement. I aim to lay groundwork, establish connections, and mobilize action. I live because my ancestors survived a war of attrition, carried out by settlers in order to subjugate Plains tribes. This war of attrition decimated the North American buffalo population. By the year 1895, buffalo herds declined from tens of millions to a mere 1,500. Historic images of this era documented massive pyramids of buffalo skulls as monuments of conquest scattered throughout my ancestral lands of the Great Plains. This loss of species not only affected my ancestors, but also the land. 
running down the center of North America, the Great Plains are one of the most endangered environments. Many indigenous grasses are dependent on the buffalo to thrive and have therefore also degenerated. In fact, there can be no true restoration without roaming herds of buffalo. Belonging explores the cascading effects of a decimated species on our precious and interconnected environment. Belonging is a figurative ceramic and mixed-media sculpture in the form of a full-size buffalo skeleton that is filmed by drone, encountering the buffalo skeleton submerged in the shallow headwaters of a river, where it ostensibly taints the water source. Belonging expresses how losing one species a hundred years ago has lasting effects in the 21st century. Through land-based action, sculpture, and video, this work implores audiences not to wait another hundred years to protect the next species in peril. The land is, the ocean is, the sky is, the earth is. And long before we are, but we are the living things. And in this rhythm is our place, not separate, but belonging to something much greater than any single beat. Our edge is defined by its relationship to that which it touches and can be touched, and so it is. There is a story of belonging that began as a blood clot, drying in the grass on the land. As it coagulated in the sun, it wept and sang out loud, certain of its demise. The sad song was heard by the buffalo, and she did not pass it by, but stops to see what was the matter. The blood clot expressed through the sobs that it was weak, and it would die here and never be anything but blood spilt on the land. The buffalo replied with a deep breath through her nose that the blood was so pathetic. She first expressed that the blood should be happy, that it is anything at all, and then she proceeded to tell this blood that she was moved by its song, and told the blood that her nation was strong. She then lowered her head and whispered into the blood clot that it could help itself to her blood to increase its numbers, that it could help itself to her muscles to increase its strength that it could help itself to her hide to protect it from the sun and the sky and the weather, and that her bones were strong and they could be used as tools for the blood, and they could learn to take care of themselves and everything else on the land. And then she gave her life up there, and the blood had a chance and a debt, and soon the blood became a people, and the people remembered the debt and gave thanks and made many offerings and took care of the land, and in turn, the land took care of them. Later, a different people came and forced the people to look at the land the way they did. To them it was separate and wild and must be dominated and controlled. The people disagreed with one another, and they fought, and more blood was spilt in the grass on the land. In order to feed the people who belonged to the land, a war of attrition was declared, and the Buffalo Nation, tens of millions strong, were systematically destroyed, and the land was void of a powerful nation, and it began to suffer its absence. And one people was forced to be like the other, and to see the land as something, separate, that could be owned and controlled. Their songs and dances and way of life were forbidden, forced to put aside its debts and its belongings. But as an extension of the land, their stories could not be forgotten, for their stories of belonging began as a blood clot drying in the grass on the land. In the words of Kanupa Hanska Luger, in the 1800s, when the U.S. Army lost in battle against the Plains tribes, of which I am a descendant, a different type of war was waged against us. With aims to decimate our food supply and way of life, soldiers and settlers orchestrated a full-on massacre of the buffalo. This war of attrition took its toll on my people and other Plains tribes. 
the crash in buffalo population represented not only a dietary impact, but also a loss of spirit, land, and indigenous autonomy. The loss was tremendous, unfathomable, and inhumane. With the disappearance of the buffalo, we were forced to become more dependent on settler economies and were forced onto reservations. Tribal land was seized, parceled, and fenced. The late 19th century was a time of Western expansion, and settlers were easily incentivized to kill buffalo as a way to clear land for settlement. A bounty was put on buffalo. Every dead buffalo symbolized a dead Indian. Teams of settler hunters roamed the plains, killing up to 1,000 buffalo in a single day. Without these wide-ranging herds, who migrated cross-continental distances, American progress was unhindered. The historical images of this era document towering pyramids of buffalo skulls. These are testaments to settler might and monuments of conquest. They communicated a warning to Native people, a haunting commitment to our destruction. Buffalo are a symbol of freedom. They represent sustenance and survival for Indigenous people. They have agency and immense power. Their might is matched by an innate duty to care for all who encounter them. They give endlessly. Even after extinction, we continue to benefit from their sacrifice. In this way, I see buffalo not only as victims, but as the fallen heroes of the American Indian War. As collateral damage for the war that I continually survive, the buffalo were true martyrs. Found Nation is a reliquary to acknowledge the accumulation of loss, the entropy of societal waste, and the cascading effects of a decimated species on our precious and interconnected environment. This work is part of an ongoing series titled Emergent, which honors the Buffalo Nation. Janina Myronova from Rockaw, Poland, earned her MFA from the Department of Ceramic Art at Lviv National Academy of Fine Arts in Lviv, Ukraine in 2012. An MFA from the Department of Ceramics and Glass at the Academy of Fine Arts and Design in Rockaw, Poland in 2013, and her PhD from the Department of Ceramics and Glass at the Academy of Fine Arts in Rockaw in 2019. Continually developing her work and practice, Myronova has attended numerous residencies, including opportunities at the New Taipei Yingi Ceramics Museum in New Taipei, Taiwan, Clay Arch Gimhae Museum in South Korea, Lefebvre and Fee in Paris, France, and the International Ceramic Research Center in Guldegard, Denmark. For her work, Myra Nova has received myriad awards and honors, including the Silver Award at First Yate Lotus Mountain Prize in China, the Franz Rising Star Project Scholarship in Taiwan, and being named as one of Ceramic Monthly's Emerging Artists of 2019. Visiting, learning, meeting, creating, exchanging became the senses of her life. We always make choices. She has never been disappointed for her decision to spend her creative life with clay. Ceramic processes became emotional for her. She is choosing places where she would like to work, where she would like to learn, and places are choosing her as well. Being active, she decided to go from place to place and visit new studios to create her works. She does not have her own studio at the same time because she has so many of them around the world. Belonging has given her a wide range of opportunities. Every day there is taking and giving, exchanging and learning. In her sculptures, she refers to the ceramic process and friendship within the ceramic community. Each figure is a different personality and a special story about everyday life as a ceramic artist. Belonging, creating opportunities, creating contacts, taking positive vibrations from the adventure road. She was born in Ukraine, belonging to Ukrainian. She lived in Poland, belonging to Polish, and she creates from clay, belonging to the ceramic community. Being far from her family, she is finding her family in the ceramic community. Understanding and supporting is what she would like to find there. In the words of Janina Maranoa, my characters display a specific distorted body perspective. The forms are a bit clunky, chubby, anatomically misshapen, marked with accents that double the characters or hybridize their silhouettes. 
Each sculpture is a different personality, a personal story, a graphic novel featuring my favorite motifs, images of family relationships, parent and child, partners, pets. My emotions are scratched into them with a subtle hint towards humor. Wonder, anger, fear, and joy are all present. What also influences the emotional charge of the figures is the color scheme of my sculptures, defining the characters and saturating their personal stories placed on the bodies and clothing. I emphasize their coloration by the black and white drawings in the background, constituting a backdrop to my stories. Kelly O'Brien was a full-time potter in North Carolina for almost a decade before earning an MFA in 2014 from Arizona State University. She has been a resident artist in several places, including the Archie Bray Foundation in Helena, Montana, International Ceramic Studio Keskimit, Hungary, and the Pottery Workshop in Jingdezhen, China. The National Council for Education on the Ceramic Arts named her an emerging artist in 2015. O'Brien completed a postdoctoral research fellowship at West Virginia University in ceramic production methods and ceramic digital technology and joined the faculty as an assistant professor of ceramics at the University of Dallas in the fall of 2017. Historically, the plate format commemorates specific events, memorializes people, or monumentalizes places. These pieces, quiet, carved domestic scenes, focus on furniture and space as company and serve as portraits of the unseen connection to a place from her past that she calls home. These carved spaces are saturated with her struggle to balance her present home with the weight of having left her old one. The furniture holds the connection and love of the rural home of her youth. The space surrounding it is the buoyancy of her current path. Portrait of Quiet contains a plush red armchair she got from her neighbor's son after his father died. She remembers Mr. H sitting in this chair from her childhood visits to their house, his wife sitting in her wheelchair, legs covered in an afghan with their function lost to polio in the 1950s. Portrait of Not Rocking holds one of O'Brien's favorite chairs, full of someone else's history that she will never know because she bought it for $25 in a thrift store. So she has given it stories, seeing her own embed themselves in the green velvet as the days wear on it. Portrait of an empty corner holds the weight of balancing the past and the present, of being two places at once, of the importance of remembering and the gravity of forgetting. In the words of Kelly O'Brien, I am interested in the disintegration of memory and awareness in how we navigate through the world. As young humans, we begin to understand shapes, forms, and relationships that are important. We live with these understandings, build on them, carry a mental database so dense that we don't even think about it most of the time. Time and age obscure this information, turning it upside down, mixing it with incongruous knowledge, muddling even the most familiar into confusion. How do we make our way in the world as our minds age and our ability to recognize symbols becomes impaired? Often, with grace and ease, we forget things. We don't know we have forgotten. We don't know that we don't know, and we don't mind. Conversely, it is more frightening when we realize we've forgotten, but we can't make sense of that loss. I use objects as placeholders for stories, experiences, even people I want to remember or that I think I will forget. Danielle O'Malley is a sculptor of large-scale objects, and she is working and residing in Helena, Montana. O'Malley earned her MFA at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, completed a ceramics-focused post-baccalaureate program at Montana State University, and her BFA from Plymouth State University. She has been a resident artist at Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts, the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art, and the Red Lodge Clay Center. She consistently participates in solo and group exhibitions. O'Malley's work can be found in the permanent collections of the Northwest Art Gallery in Minot, North Dakota, the Silver Bow Art Gallery in Butte, Montana, and the Daoshi Xuan Art Center in Jingdezhen, China. An unstable foundation relates to the exhibition concept because it is symbolic of our naive dependence on overconsumption and unsustainable products. 
The hammock is made from deconstructed plastic shopping bags that were crocheted together to form a net that attaches to the architecture of the installation space, which roots this piece to our present time and space. This piece demonstrates how our modern way of life is not sustainable as the earthen sculpture sags to the ground. In the words of Danielle O'Malley, my work is rooted in an environmental consciousness that derives from my concern for the earth's rapidly declining health. I use it to highlight the misuse and abuse that humanity inflicts on local and global ecologies. I make hand-built monumental sculptures using strong formal devices, gestural installation placement, sensual form, and conscious material usage to create work that is symbolically charged. My forms are influenced by domestic and industrial objects that I experience in my daily life that are indicative of sustainable living and warning symbols. I marry my earthen objects with industrial surplus that is recontextualized through textile processes, and the contrasting media charges my work with tension. The union of materials serves as a metaphor for the complex relationship that humanity has with nature. I hope that my passion for making and my love for the earth, in combination with my work, encourages people to join me in reconsidering our daily routines. Ame Papazian was born in Manhasset, New York. She creates installations and objects using ceramics, wood, and wire. Her work has been exhibited in juried shows across the U.S., and she has work on permanent public display and in private collections. She has been an artist in residence at Guldegard Ceramic Center in Denmark and the Zentrum for Ceramic in Berlin, Germany. She is a recipient of the Artist 360 grant. She has a BA in Art Semiotics from Brown University and an MFA in Film and Video from the Milton Avery School of the Arts at Bard College. Papazian grew up in New York and she now lives in Arkansas with her family. Imposter Syndrome Lullaby relates to the exhibition concept because it is about the feeling that one is not good enough to belong in a certain community or space. The piece is part of a series of word clouds made with extruded porcelain words that show persistent repetitive thoughts and string them together in phrases and word fragments that resemble muddled thought processes. The elements of this piece are the words shh, and just another asshole, interspersed with simplified line drawings of ocean waves in an ombre of blues. In the words of a May Papazian, I begin by making ceramic elements, and then I weave them together using collective forms found in flocks of birds or schools of fish. Fleeting and in flux, the forms of these masses offer me a way to approach any idea I am preoccupied with, usually an idea about identity or communication. I can use any bird as the element that I start from and then use it to layer the larger form with color, shape, and other meaning. What I am searching for with my work is a shift in perspective, a distance from my own limited sense of reality, that crack where the light gets in. What I look toward to help me magnify this crack are the things that pull me out of my own drama looking up at the sky or down into the sea or inward to the jumble of my own thoughts, but from a different angle. We are here as part of something that we will never see the whole of, and the forms I use help me remember that we are connected to the flow of life on this planet in ways we can't see or understand. Deshaun Peoples is a ceramic artist and designer from Chicago, Illinois, who is currently teaching and serving as the studio technician at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Peoples has shown his work in solo and group exhibitions, including a solo exhibition at Bates College Olin Art Center and group exhibitions at Rhode Island School of Design's Woods Gary and Gelman Galleries, the Waterfire Art Center in Providence, Worcester Center for Craft, the Clay Studio in Philadelphia, and Saratoga Clay Art Center. Peoples earned his dual BA in Studio Art and Rhetorical Theory and Criticism from Bates College in 2017 and his MFA in Ceramics from Rhode Island School of Design in 2021. His honors include an apprenticeship with artist Theaster Gates and a Fulbright Student Research Grant to study Chinese porcelain production and traditional design techniques in Jingdezhen, China. 
Blood Kin relates to the exhibition concept because it too explores the dimensions to belonging in different spaces as he navigates intersectional identities. This piece is primarily concerned with the act of taking up physical and socio-political space. Through the use of form, design, color, and installation, this work places various histories and traditions of both ceramics and resistance in communication with one another. The red, 3D printed, and slip cast spheres and black stoneware cups of Marcus Garvey's 1920 Pan African Black American flag sit proudly displayed, bound together by steel tubing a reference to the firearms used by the Black Panthers to project strength and resist police brutality. Taking up space in galleries and other art platforms proclaims that there is power, validity, and importance in a functional vessel. Through this work, he explores sculptural ceramic table settings for pottery to physically inhabit more space than is typically allotted for it on a dinner table, as well as inconvenience for those who use it, catalyzing a conversation about the place of new ideas and representation in traditional rigid systems. In the words of Deshaun Peoples, in my work, I explore the interaction between form and minimal surfaces, colors that elicit specific emotional responses in order to interrogate personal and societal standards of beauty and value as they relate to notions of equity, representation, and lasting effects on mental health. Clay as a material and abstraction as a visual vocabulary both afford the ability to reconstruct reality. To mold clay is to exert one's own will onto the physical earth around them, and through glazing and firing make real and permanent the object of one's imagination. Using non-representational lines and shapes to make meaning invites the possibility of a single stroke to invoke an infinite number of historical, contemporary, societal, or personal narratives. Making meticulous forms reclaims the agency stripped by being marginalized in institutions that work to entrench the unrelenting societal doctrine that my existence is less valuable than that of my majority counterparts. Born and raised in the border city of El Paso, Texas, George Rodriguez creates humorous decorative ceramic sculptures addressing his identity and community. Brought up by his mother and four older sisters, his art began as a search for his individualized voice that evolved into community and cultural storytelling. Rodriguez earned a BFA in ceramics from the University of Texas at El Paso, then went on to complete an MFA at the University of Washington. His world curiosity grew as a recipient of a Bonderman Travel Fellowship, where he traveled the world through most of 2010. This travel continues to have a profound influence on Rodriguez and his art. His work can be found in the permanent collection of the National Mexican Museum of Art in Chicago and the Halley Ford Museum in Salem, Oregon. Rodriguez is represented by Foster White Gallery in Seattle, Washington, and is an artist in residence at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture in Philadelphia. George Rodriguez wanted to depict this large-scale rat with a regal posture. These animals that are often overlooked and mistreated are resilient, smart, and resourceful. They belong and have made their homes just as we all try to do within our communities. In the words of George Rodriguez, I work with an ancient material to address my contemporary experience. Ceramics is an art form uniquely tactile and malleable. I employ this material in its most traditional sculptural capacity to present complex social issues of inclusivity, community, and self-reflection. Through the creation of guardian figures, tomb sculptures, and shrines, I depict my community current and forthcoming. I hope to bring these objects, ancient relics that transcend time, into the present. They carry hope and loss, acceptance and challenge, ornament and simplicity. I use traditional and iconic imagery and forms to make my work feel familiar. Through the narratives I choose, I bring whimsical, serious, and approachable aspects into the objects. I love decoration. I enjoy how heavy decoration can seem parasitic yet it beckons to be adored and looked at. 
Decoration adds a layer of stimulation to an object. It's intended to give pleasure. The more intently you look, the more rewarding it will be. Patricia Sanet was born in Cleveland, Ohio. She earned a BA in art history, Norwegian, and fine art at the University of Minnesota and an MFA with high distinction at the California College of Art. Sanet has worked on archaeological sites in the Near East and Ethiopia. Her art connects with her study of archaeology, migration, and culture. Sanet has worked in many collections. Awards include the Sculpt Artist Award, Arizona Art Commission Project Award, and an Influx Grant. She has been a guest artist at the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. Exhibits include the Phoenix Art Museum and the Mulvane Museum in Topeka, Kansas. Patricia is a founder of Art Farm, an art collective working to bring art into communities and a founding member of the Artist Advisory Committee of the Ceramic Research Center at ASU. Upcoming are exhibitions at the Tempe Center of the Arts and Scottsdale Center for the Arts. Unboundarying, a multimedia piece, rubs at the boundary between human intervention and wild spaces. We belong to nature on nature's terms. This video was shot daily over the course of two weeks in northern Iceland. After mowing a strip of grass, she placed 100 clay markers mounted on wire at the boundary between the mown and the unmown. She shaped the markers after the forms of the driftwood fence posts in the region and carved them with word patterns referencing named places. The wind blew, the grass grew, the markers bent, cracked, stood, fell. Her effort to mark the place between man and nature was documented, as was the meaninglessness of her effort, as there is no boundary. She collected the markers, removing her footprint. The grass grew. In the words of Patricia Sanet, this past year has produced a shift in my studio practice. I have moved towards making art that brings people together and that speaks to rehoming ourselves in nature. To create community, I invite people to participate in my projects, to connect our stories to each other, to anchor the work to the broader narrative of being human. I use cultural patterns, maps, and marks. We are human. We are nature. I keep in mind the phrase, in the middle of nowhere, meaning being far from human inhabitation. We call being amidst the infinity of nature, nowhere, demonstrating our self-focus. I watch the efficient ant communities, the industrious bees, the adaptability of fungi, the trees' patient growth, and chemical conversations, and I know that we are in the middle of everything, that our cities are our creation, but of small importance to the universe to which we belong. I am rewilding myself and my work to belong in nature. I'm creating conversations that allow space for all living things. Josh Schutz is a figurative ceramic sculptor from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Schutz earned his BA in art history and MA in ceramics from Minnesota State University in Mankato, Minnesota. They then moved to Alfred, New York in 2018 to pursue their MFA at the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. Schutz has exhibited nationally in museums across the U.S., as well as taught workshops and classes at community art centers in Minnesota and New York. They work out of their studio in Brooklyn, New York, where they currently reside. As a queer, gender nonconforming individual who grew up in a conservative community in rural Minnesota, they often reflect back on what it means to belong then and now. They have breasts, rolls, and waves, and with these they create bridges. Their body has its own language, and they celebrate it as a tool to connect with others. In the words of Joshua Schutz, I create autobiographical figurative work reflecting societal influences and pressures. As a queer, gender nonconforming individual, I grew up in a conservative community in rural Minnesota. The pride of my individuality during trials and tribulations of my adolescence have translated into figurative ceramics, celebrating a cultural moment. 
Luster is a repeating motif in my work as it conveys opulence and exquisite materiality, which contrasts with my non-ideal male form and my tendencies to approach form or concept with reckless abandon. For the past two years, I have been creating work with the idea of performative narcissism in mind. This is a term I coined from a political and cultural moment when self-interests are above a more holistic view of living as a part of a community or nation. In performing narcissism, I find myself in a paradoxical act of bringing attention to my work, my body, but also reclaiming space for a queer audience. R.J. Sturgis is a mixed media sculptor living and working in Atlanta, Georgia, making work about the discomfort and awkwardness inherent to the human condition. Sturgis graduated with his BFA in ceramics and a BS in metals and jewelry from Buffalo State College in Buffalo, New York in 2012 and earned his MFA in ceramics from the Welch School of Art and Design at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia in 2020. He has exhibited his work across the country in venues such as the Clay Center of New Orleans, the Blue Line Art Center in Lincoln, California, the Hartsfield Jackson International Airport in Atlanta, and most recently as part of the 2021 Enseca Conference. Sturgis currently works as ceramic studio manager at the Hudgens Center for Art in Duluth, Georgia, and maintains an active studio practice. Grandpa's chair relates to the exhibition concept of belonging because this piece references a moment when he was a child, and while sitting in his grandfather's armchair, he started to play with the tufts, specifically the buttons in the middle of the tufts. He was so invested in them that he shut the world out around him. He couldn't hear anything or see anything else other than the buttons. This is where he feels like he belongs, being so absorbed with his work or zoned out that the world around him just seems to fade to the background. In the words of R.J. Sturgis, through my sculptures, I look at life through the lens of vulnerability, awkwardness, and discomfort, embracing the perspective that ugliness, weakness, and flaws are part of what it means to be human. By creating unusual, awkward relationships between biomorphic ceramic forms and fragmented elements of domestic space, I provoke feelings of discomfort. This discomfort echoes uncomfortable memories and their lingering effects. By appearing vulnerable, weak, and weird, yet familiar, these works reveal how I view myself. My sculptures provoke investigation through unexpected elements like faux fur, hair, rolls, or crevices. These bodily references are vital components to my work because I consider the forms to be representations of myself. Their blobby, structureless forms recreate my ever-changing level of anxiety, my perpetual reliving of awkward moments. Decisions about form, surface treatment, and space highlight the awkwardness of each piece and therefore question what comfort is. Phyllis Cutter Sullivan has exhibited her ceramic sculptures in one-person and group exhibitions in galleries and museums throughout the U.S. and internationally. Her work has been accepted into international biennials in the U.S., South Korea, France, Hungary, Italy, Spain, and Australia. Sullivan's interlaced sculptures have been reviewed in the New York Times and appeared in numerous magazine articles and books. She has been the recipient of visiting artist and artist-in-residence grants in the U.S., Europe, and China. Sullivan is a trustee of the Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts and resides in Brooklyn, New York. Water Arc No. 1 from the River Project is a multiple-unit floor work that uses rivers as a metaphor for belonging and connectivity. The arc is a curving trajectory of flowing water that reminds us we all belong to our biosphere, to humanity, and to one another. Rivers connect cities to each other. Primordial waters envelop us in a continuum of time and rivers, essential sources of clay, become a means to connect ceramic artists with our creative history and provide a sense of belonging to an artist community. Individual pieces in water arc number one fit together as in a jigsaw puzzle where each unit belongs to a greater whole. In the words of Phyllis Cutter Sullivan, starting with a residency in the river city of Talavera, Spain in 2018, I became fascinated with rivers and the cities through which they flow. 
My research led to several river mapping projects and numerous pencil drawings of moving water. The construction technique that I use, an over-under weave of coils, lends itself to the idea of change, light, shadow, and fluidity. Unlike a traditional basket, my organic interlaced sculptures completely envelop the interior space. The only visual access to the interior is through the various openings between the open grid of coils, thus replicating the interface of water and air. By thoughtfully placing multiple pieces together on a floor, I can suggest the currents, ripples, waves, and eddies of moving water. Through the use of colored clay and stains, I capture the numerous color shifts between seasons, weather conditions, and time of day, as well as changes in hue due to variables of algae and sediment resulting from human activity. Lydia Thompson earned her BFA from The Ohio State University and her MFA from the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. Her awards include a Fulbright Hayes grant to conduct research on traditional architecture in Nigeria and a VCU Arts Institutional grant for research at the Guldegard International Ceramic Research Center Artist in Residency in Denmark. Thompson also served as an AIR at the Medalta Ceramic Center in Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada. Her work has been included in art centers and museums such as the Society for Contemporary Crafts, Baltimore Clay Works, or O'Keeffe Museum, Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft, Te Tumata Gallery in New Zealand, and Guldegard in Denmark. Her work is in private and public collections in Ohio, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Virginia, New Zealand, Austria, Switzerland, and Italy. She has conducted workshops, given public lectures, and served as juror and curator for national and regional exhibitions. Specified Travels, New World, Treat Them as Stock, Learn That Home is Always Some Other Shore. This work was inspired by the novel Feeding the Ghosts by Fred Diaguar and is based on a true story about a slave ship packed with captive African slaves. It represents the daydreams of enslaved and freed Africans and African Americans journeying to freedom, the present, and their continuous search for a place in this world. In the words of Lydia Thompson, my work is reminiscent of working-class family homes in which the structure tells stories about communities that have changed over time. The contents of these homes consist of my grandmother's reclaimed ceramic figurines that I began breaking down and fusing the ceramic shards with glaze. The broken shards' meanings include loss of family, unemployment, and the effort to rid society of Confederate monuments so as to evoke change. This work is also a response to the removal of Confederate monuments that honored individuals who oppressed people and a gesture of the importance of deconstructing the historical and contemporary Eurocentric aristocratic system that represents privileged lifestyles. The act of breaking ceramics for me, as in the ancient membranes of the U.S., in which they carved holes in the bottom of ceramic vessels, known as kill holes, and then buried them with the dead. These vessels were placed on the heads of the deceased and served as conduits to the afterlife. Daniel Alejandro Trejo is a queer Latinx visual artist based out of Stockton, California, working in ceramic sculpture with an adjacent practice in curatorial projects. He earned his B.A. in Art Studio and Art History from the University of California, Davis. Subsequent to completing his undergraduate studies, he obtained a studio residency at Verge Center for the Arts in Sacramento, where he concurrently taught ceramics as an educational associate. He now continues his practice at Verge. Trejo's curatorial projects include organizing Sacramento Zine Fest and organizing group exhibitions under his collaborative project, Unibrow Collective. The collaborative projects are intended to broaden conversations about practices in under-recognized communities in contemporary discourse and provide curated spaces for many voices, experiences, and situations. 
He recently participated in exhibitions in Los Angeles, Dallas, and Denver. Trejo is currently affiliated with Monte Vista Projects in Los Angeles. Danielle Alejandro Trejo's identity is subtly presented in the works. There aren't many queer people of color working in ceramic sculpture with similar backgrounds that he has, which is why he decided to focus on producing 3D works. Becoming too visible can disrupt the quality of life for the queer community because gender and sexual expression can generate disapproval and violence by those who abide by binary beliefs of gender and sex. The forms of his sculptures are ambiguous, leaving room for hidden emotions, attitudes, or motivations to be projected by the viewer. Pastel-colored underglazes are used in his work to invite and encourage exploration of the forms, prompting self-awareness through contemplation and desire for responsiveness. A soft color palette in his aesthetic alludes to his personal queer sensibilities and need to be humorous when bringing in difficult topics for discussion. Issues regarding the loss of romantic, civil, social, environmental, and filial connections surface, allowing the viewer to be cognizant of what was lost and what was gained. Traces of absence suffered by culture and community haunt spaces where tragedy occurred. Trejo's current work alludes to the insecurity of selfhood, the future, and the desire to be in safe spaces during a time of preoccupied security and surveillance. The sculptures can be perceived as being disturbed or lopsided objects that lean in and out while standing on cadaverous pedestals, implicating that permanence and stability are not guaranteed. His interest in clay formed after understanding its contradictory nature for being instant and requiring much needed patience and care for further development. It is both strong and weak. Realizing the limitations of the material provoked his sense of curiosity and an appreciation for clay instead of pigeonholing its use to craft. In the words of Daniel Alejandro Trejo, my curiosity stemmed from my personal upbringing and experiences of living in a perilous environment. The complex layers of violence, forced disappearance, and the demand for safe public spheres are unpacked in my work and interests as an artist. Amethyst Haltman Warrington was born in Iowa City, Iowa, but she was raised in a mobile military family growing up around the U.S. and Europe. She earned her BFA in ceramics with minors in art history and art from the University of Northern Iowa in 2014. While working on her bachelor's degree, she studied abroad at the Jingdezhen Ceramic Institute for a semester in Jingdezhen, China, through West Virginia University's China program. In 2021, Warrington earned her MFA, emphasizing in ceramics with a minor in textiles, merchandising, and fashion design at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Between her undergraduate and graduate studies, she was a resident artist and later interim director of the Iowa Ceramic Center and Glass Studio in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The distance between porcelain hands, one 3D and the other the imprint left by the other person are displayed on opposite sides of the same wall as if they were touching through the wall. The paint on the edge of the circular objects matches the paint on the wall's edge, emphasizing the importance of the distance between one another. They are unable to connect through the physical and emotional distance. This space between people can speak louder than anything said or not said. She noticed similar feelings of disconnection and isolation while social distancing during quarantine as she did following the death of someone she loved. These experiences provide an opportunity for self-examination to explore her connection to others, develop empathy, and a sense of belonging. In the words of Amethyst Warrington, in my work, I explore the beauty and pain of loss through art. I physically bear down into the clay, then remove the object, leaving a void to physically represent the emotional weight and experience leaves on us, making the invisible visible. I utilize clay's unique physical properties of malleability, recyclability, and permanence. These meticulously crafted, beautiful objects draw you into serious and often taboo subjects to comfort those who need it, while challenging those who are comfortable. 
Kathy Yoshihara is a graphic designer by day, but her passion is art. She earned her BA in painting, sculpture, and graphic arts from the University of California, Los Angeles, and has been working in ceramics for more than 10 years. She is a local Southern California mixed media artist who combines her graphic design computer skills with glass and ceramics to create vignettes that incorporate family images and memorabilia. She has participated in numerous group shows and has been awarded Best of Show three times. She is a member of the California Japanese Ceramic Arts Guild, American Ceramic Society Design Chapter, Southern California, and the Mid-Valley Arts League. What Would You Pack relates to the concept of belonging in terms of possessions. When the Japanese Americans were in prison during World War II, they were only allowed to take what they could carry. Most lost all their possessions, except for the items they could carry. Some destroyed anything Japanese that would associate them with the enemy. In this piece, she explores the question, what would you pack? With a limited amount of space, what treasures would you choose to take or leave behind? Suitcases played a prominent role as they were the most common vehicle that were used to carry one's belongings. In What Would You Pack, she wanted to view it from a child's perspective, as shown by his choices in the suitcase. He is placed in the suitcase as if he is one of the items to be taken. In the words of Kathy Yoshihara, my current focus is creating visual pieces based on the internment camps. I use my background in computer graphics to create glass and ceramic decals to give my work a historical backdrop, which often includes family photos, images, and memorabilia. I then combine it with ceramic pieces to create my interpretation of camp life. My work is not so much a social comment, but more of a realization of my identity, heritage, and tribute to my ancestors and those who paved the path for me. 